Sorry, I was, we don't normally do a little prayer right there, but um, I needed that. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but this isn't, uh, this is a little off script this morning, but uh, and I was getting a little choked up in that last song when it's saying, show me who you are and, and fill me with your heart. You know, I had a little, uh, a little bit of an incident this week where, I don't know if it's an incident, but whatever, but uh, I had a little bit of a... Uh, have you ever felt like your head and your heart were in different places? So your head was telling you one thing, but your heart, you, you weren't feeling it. And so I, I was in this place where I knew what God said to do in a particular situation. I knew what was right, but my heart didn't want to go there. So that's kind of what I was just thinking about when I was singing that song. And so why I came off mic a couple of times. But anyway, and that's why I wanted to pray. But anyway, I, I just, uh, I'm so glad that you guys are here. And... Um, if you're visiting with us this morning, we want you to know that you're our honored guest. We want you to feel super comfortable and, and, uh, and leave here with some type of blessing. And not one that will end with you, but one that you'll be able to go out from here and share with somebody else. Uh, when you came in this morning, hopefully someone handed you a worship bulletin. And on the inside of that, I want to encourage everybody to open that up now and take out what we call our sermon notes. You'll see them. they got little blanks and stuff. And hopefully you've got a pen and, and you can follow along as we go through the lesson this morning. It'll help you stay awake. It'll help you focus and really hear what God wants to say this morning. And also, as you go out through your week, you'll have something to take with you and hopefully reflect on throughout your week. And hopefully at, this morning, we're going to give you something really practical that you can do uh, with God's Word. But we're in, a, we're in a series. This is number three in our series. Um, it's called The Miracle of Mercy. And I really do believe that there are several miracles of mercy that we can benefit from if we can just wrap our minds and hearts around this idea of what, what is mercy and who is God and how merciful really is He. And so there's some big questions in life. Raise your hand if you've ever, if these big questions have ever come up across your brain or in conversation, but here's some of the big questions of life. What's the meaning of life? Where did life come from? Where did this universe come from? Where do I fit? Anybody? These questions ringing a bell? Okay. Where do I fit in this whole equation? What happens when I die? Anybody? Yeah, what happens when I die? Um, I got to get together with a, a good friend uh, this week and talk about that very question that was weighing on his mind. What happens when we die? And then finally, what should I do with my life in the meantime? Like, what am I supposed to be doing right now before I die, right? There's hopefully some time in between there, right, that, that's going to pass. So what am I supposed to be doing with that time? So this morning, we're going to kind of uh, answer a lot of that, but especially that last question. This is not in your notes, but look up on the screen. There's a passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 that's really powerful. This would be a good one to memorize if you can. But it says, He, referring to God, has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. He has also, look, look at what He did. He also planted eternity. In other words, a sense of divine purpose in the human heart. And this is a mysterious longing that he put there, right? Which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. Now think about it for a second. We'll finish reading that in a second, but think about this. He said he put eternity, he planted this eternity. Eternity's big, right? It's hard to wrap your mind around. Well, listen, when you start talking about planting eternity in your heart. I've heard some commentators go that God has put a God-shaped hole inside of man. And what is the only thing that can fill a God-shaped hole? God. Nothing else is big enough. Nothing else will satisfy. So this is such a cool gift that God has given. There's a reason you ask these big questions that are bigger than you, that are beyond you. There's reasons for that. It's because God put it in you to think about. He put it in you to ponder. He put it in you to wonder because he has big things in mind. He set eternity in your heart so that you would perhaps reach for that. Look at what he finishes saying. He says, yet man, yet man cannot find out, comprehend, or grasp what God has done. His overall plan from beginning to end, we ain't got it all figured out. But there's this longing 
to be a part of something beyond myself, something bigger than me. Raise your hand if you've wanted to become a part of something bigger than yourself. It's because God put that there. Are you inquisitive? You have lots of questions. It's because God wanted you to have those questions. And you know, I just want to encourage you this morning, if you've got doubts about God, you've got ponderings, you've got wonderings about God, God is not afraid of your questions. The truth is never afraid of inquiry. And you, this morning, I want you to know, you were made for a far bigger purpose than just living for yourself. If you're living for yourself and that's all you got right now, I'm not saying this in a rude way, but I do feel sorrow for you. Because, man, I'm telling you, if you live for just yourself and you're not living for something bigger than yourself, if you're not reaching out and trying to figure out who God is and what he wants for your life and what you're supposed to be doing with your life for God, you will eventually get bored, you will get frustrated, and and you're going to end up in all kinds of trouble because what you're going to do is you're going to try to fill that eternity-shaped hole with all kinds of crazy stuff. And you'll never have enough. There's a reason why addicts never have enough drugs. And they never hit the spot. Of, oh, that, yeah, that, that, that scratched the itch right there. And that, I don't need any more. <laughs> There's a reason why alcoholics go back for a drink and after drink after drink after drink. There's a reason why people who are sex addicts go for one exploit after another after another after another. There's a reason for this. Because you're trying to fill something that only God can fill. And it won't work. And so I want to encourage you this morning to know that God has something really big planned for you. But I wonder, are you living just for yourself? Are you open to the idea of, okay, God, tell me what you want. Tell me what you want from me. If you got something big, you're telling me it's bigger than getting a degree at college? Yep, it's way bigger than that. You're telling me it's bigger than my career and making sure I get that six-figure income? Oh, my goodness, it's way bigger than that. You tell me it's bigger than finding a husband or a wife and having babies and, and, a, and a dog and a cat? Yeah, the American dream? Yeah, it's way bigger than the American dream. And I think the faster we can figure out that God's got this big thing in mind and that we join him in that, the more we're going to begin to see what the topic of the sermon this morning is really addressing. And that is, look at the, look at the heading. Because the God of mercy, because of God's merciful nature, he can use me. So this morning, I want to show you how God can use you, how he wants to use you. I want to give you some secrets, okay? Before we dive into these secrets, though, look at Romans chapter 6. It's the first passage on your notes. It says this. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome. And he says, don't let any part of your bodies... Don't let any part of your bodies become tools of wickedness to be used for sinning. But give yourselves completely to God. Every part of you, for you are back from death and you want to be tools in the hands of God to be used for his good purposes. Man, I don't know if that gets you excited or not. If it doesn't, then your wood is wet, okay? And ain't nobody going to light you. If that doesn't light you, okay, and get you excited, I don't know. The God of all creation, the all-powerful God of the universe says, I want you to be my instrument. I want you to be my tool in the world to go do something great. And you go, no, I'm a little busy doing stuff that doesn't matter into eternity. What you going to take with you beyond the grave? There are not, there's not a whole lot of things in this world you can take with you beyond the grave. You can take souls with you, hopefully. But that ain't going to happen until you align yourself with God and let him use you as his tool, as his instrument of righteousness and, and good. Here's the problem. Let's get real for a second. The problem is a lot of people secretly really don't think that God can ever really use them. I don't know if you feel that way. Maybe, you go, oh yeah, he could use me for a little something, something. No, 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 I'm talking about something great. Something that will blow everyone's mind when they see you doing it. They go, what? That's, I remember that guy. What is he, 
Wow. I remember that girl, man. She was that party girl, man. She was the, she was the drunkest one at the party. What is she doing? Whoa. But I wonder if you go, no, all those great things, that's for somebody else. Or do you really believe that God wants to use you as his instrument to do something powerful in this world? What I found over the years, people fall into one of two categories. They either feel disqualified or they feel unqualified. Y'all know what I mean by that? disqualified because, oh, Mackie, if you knew where I came from, if you knew my past, if you knew all the things that I'm involved in, yeah, you wouldn't think I'm going anywhere either. You wouldn't think that I'm destined for greatness either. I'm disqualified because of my past. It's too far gone. God can't use a guy or a girl like me. I'm to this. I'm to that. I'm too hung up on you fill in the blank. I'm disqualified. Or perhaps you say I'm unqualified. And that means, oh, look at all those really talented people. No, no, God will use them for great things. I don't have those talents, so that's not really for me. I'd rather sit back over here and be a wallflower, just be quiet and be timid and just let other people do great, and I'll cheer them on. I'm unqualified. This morning, we're going to look at someone's life that blows both of those theories out of the water. When we look at this guy, this guy's name is Paul, by the way. We're going to focus on the Apostle Paul this morning. Remember, we picked on Peter long enough, okay, for a couple weeks now. We're going to move on to Paul, and we're going to look at him. Because if God can use Paul, I'm telling you, he can use anybody. I can stand up here today and go, if he can turn what I once was into what now stands before you, holy moly, he could do even greater things with some of you in the audience because you're way further along than I was at the stage of life that you find yourself. But guys, no matter where you find yourself in this equation, how far along you think you are, how much time you think you've wasted, it doesn't matter because God's mercy will touch you wherever you are if you'll let it. And then he'll take you and he'll make you his instrument and he'll do something great that you never dreamed he would do. Y'all believe that? Y'all out there this morning? Boy, I'm preaching some stuff. This ought to be exciting. I want to hear some amens every once in a while. Let me know y'all are alive, okay? All right, so let's dive in. We're going to look at the text of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to look at 18 verses, but we're not going to read them all right now. We're going to read them sort of one and two by, you know, two at a time. One and two at a time. And we're going to kind of learn what are the secrets of being able to be used by God. If I'll do these things that I learned from the life of Paul, I'm telling you, if you will do these things, God is going to do something great in you. Y'all ready? First one, we need to rely on God's mercy as our motivation. We need to rely on God's mercy as our motivation. Now, let me ask you a question. What motivates you? What makes you get up in the morning? What's the first thing on your mind when you get up in the morning? Where do, yeah, why do I have to get up? Where am I going? What am I going to do? Oh, no, am I late? Um, did my alarm go off in time? Am I going to be late? Is my boss going to fuss at me? Where are my kids? Uh, are they ready? Oh, no, and, and I got to go to the bathroom, too. Oh, my goodness, where's my phone? Where's my keys? Can I, I want to share something with you guys. We're going to learn from the life of Paul. I guarantee you none of those things were the first thing on his mind. I know. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the very first verse of this section. Paul says, Therefore, since God in his mercy gave us this work to do, in other words, this ministry, we don't give up, we don't lose heart, we don't become discouraged. Paul identifies God's mercy as his number one motivator in life. Y'all see that? Dimitri's awake. Anybody else awake? Listen, God's, <laughs> Paul says, listen, I don't know why the rest of y'all get up in the morning, but I get up because God let me get up. I try to make it a practice. 
and I kick myself when I forget sometimes. But every, just about every morning, I wake up and I try to let the first thing out of my mouth be, God, thank you for waking me up this morning and giving me the breath that I have. And I want to honor you with it today. That almost every morning that exits my mouth before I even get up to pee or do anything else. And I want that to be the case because I want to recognize and I want God to know that I recognize that the only reason I'm breathing in and out another day is because he had mercy on me. And the same is true for y'all. So y'all can get up and let a lot of things motivate you. You can let a lot of things guide your day. But I want to encourage you. Here's a secret. If you will get up and acknowledge God is the only reason you got up in the first place, your day is going to start down a better road of being used by God that day and that week. Don't get freaked out, though. You notice a word in there that's a little maybe troubling to you? It says, since God in his mercy gave us this ministry. And some of you are freaked out maybe by that word ministry. What do you mean? Oh, okay, he's talking to you right now, so I'll tune out. No, no, no. Let me help you understand something about ministry. The word is the same word in the Bible when you, uh, sometimes our English translations will translate them service. So anytime someone is serving another person, it doesn't matter what kind of service, they are ministering. If they're providing a service, they are a minister. And I'm just going to give you this radical teaching today, okay, that isn't taught by a lot of places. But everyone in here is a minister the moment you start serving someone. When we go out to lunch today, the waitress or the waiter comes to our table, takes our order, and brings us our food. She is or he is a minister. Now, she may not be a minister of Jesus Christ, but she is a minister, and he is a minister, This word, we need to take the religiosity out of it. We need to get this idea that ministry happens in these four walls on a Sunday or on a Wednesday or whenever you think church happens. That's not where ministry happens. I'm telling you, the biggest parts of ministry happen outside in the world, outside of these four walls. And God says, if you'll let my mercy motivate you, I'll use you out in that world to minister to other people. This is the whole point of it. This is what God wants us to be doing. Loving and serving other people. Being his ministers. Now, the point here that I want you not to miss. The point here is that Paul did ministry for one reason. Because God's mercy motivated him to. Hear me. No one had to beg Paul to get in a ministry and start serving. Nobody. He couldn't help but do it because he was so gripped by the reality that he should be dead, but God was merciful. What about you? Do you have to, someone have to twist your arm to be a part of a ministry? To be consistent in that ministry? To do a good job in that ministry? Can you imagine somebody having to get on to Paul? Hey, Paul, man, we need you to step up your game, okay? I mean, come on, man. You, you show up half the time. That ain't a conversation that had to be had with Paul. Why? Because he had his mind and a heart gripped. He couldn't get over the mercy of God. Some of y'all's problem is the mercy of God has never really sunk in. You can, you can call it the mercy of God. You can call it the grace of God. You can call it the kindness of God. But man, once it touches your heart, you will be the one blazing trails. And people will be trying to keep up with you and your ministry and your service. No one's going to have to ask you to do anything. You will be properly motivated. Uh, For the last few weeks, we've been working with this definition. This is our working definition of mercy. And it's it's undeserved forgiveness. And most people kind of get that from mercy. But what about the second part? It's unearned kindness. You see, it's not just intellectually going, okay, I'll let you off the hook here. I'm going to be merciful and let you off the hook, and I'm going to forgive you. It's beyond that. It's now I'm going to do something proactively good to you. I'm going to serve you, right? I'm going to give you some kindness, And this is the definition we're working with. And I want to give you a couple of benefits to understanding this uh, mercy in this way. 
When you understand that God shows you mercy every moment of your life and that he loves you unconditionally and that there's nothing you can do to stop him from loving you, And even when you blow it, that he's still going to show you mercy again and again, 70 times 7, okay, it does a couple of things. First, you know what it does? You understand your worth, and you don't have to prove it to anyone anymore. Do you know how exhausting it is? Do you know how exhausting it is for for me or you or any of us to try to spend our effort proving to someone that we are worth their time, that we are worthwhile, that we matter? Listen, that's what our world is doing. They're beating their heads against the wall trying to show people, I deserve, I am worth, I am this. We write resumes and talk so good about ourselves so we can go, I deserve more money. I deserve a better position. I deserve your attention. I am worth something. I'm just going to tell you, all that attitude, that comes from an insecurity position. That comes from someone who is deeply insecure, who has to tell you how good they are. Someone who has to brag on themselves is someone who is deeply, deeply insecure. And it's exhausting. And God goes, you don't have to be insecure. I love you. Just like you are. And here's the thing. I want you to get better. But man, I love you right now in your nasty. I love you right now in your jacked up thinking. I love you right now and I'm ready to extend mercy to you now. Not when you get it figured out and fix it. I love you right now. And that is life changing. Because then I don't have to prove myself to anyone. If I don't have to prove myself to God, I certainly don't have to prove myself to another person. Your worth has nothing to do with your work and how good you are at it. It's the fact that you're a child of God. It's the fact that God made you in his image and that he loves you enough to send his one and only son. That's how you know you're worth something. Not by how you perform, how well you do, how smart you are, how much money you make. No, God goes, don't measure your worth by that crazy stuff. That's what the world does. I'm telling you, ain't nothing more valuable than you. And I can prove it because I sent my one and only son to die for you. You're worth it. You're worth so much in the sight of God. He loves us unconditionally. The other thing that happens, I told you two things happen. One, you can stop trying to prove yourself. Right? Whew. That's so exhausting. You don't have to do that anymore. The second thing that happens when you understand God's mercy is you don't have to wallow in your mistakes anymore. We all make mistakes. We all sin. We all blow it. We make dumb, dumb, dumb decisions. And we've done it all. We've all done it in the past. Some of us are presently in the middle of some of that. But you don't have to wallow in it because God's mercy is there. And I know God is showing me mercy. I know he is. And when we get to a place where you go, I know his mercy is there. Yes, it was wrong. Yes, it was dumb. Yes, I was stupid. But I'm sorry. And I repent. And I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to turn back to that. I'm not going to dwell on it anymore. Because God goes, you're done. It's, it's done. I forgive. Let's move on. Is there a period of mourning over our sin? Yes. But man, when God moves on, we move on. We don't wallow. And when you understand his mercy, that he lets it go, then you can let it go. And you don't have to wallow. You don't have to dwell. The past doesn't have to be a hitching post. It can be a guidepost. In Galatians chapter 1, look at this verse. This is verse 13 and verse 15. It says, you know what I was like, Paul says. Remember, I told you we're going to learn from Paul. If he can do it, any of us can do it. Paul says, you know what I was like, how I violently persecuted Christians. I did my best to get rid of them. But then something happened. For it pleased God in his kindness, another word for mercy, to choose me and call me even before I was born. What undeserved mercy. Do you know who Paul was? He was a terrorist. He was in the kin of ISIS, the ones that hunt and target specifically Christians. This is who Paul was. 
and God extends mercy to him. He doesn't smite him and go, okay, you're messing with my people, zap. That's not what he does to Paul. He doesn't hire a sniper to go hunt him down and kill him so he'll stop killing his people. God goes to a man named Ananias, and he goes, hey, Ananias, uh, yeah, I'm going to appear to this guy, Paul, in a vision. And, you know, I'm appearing to you to give you a heads up. He's going to come see you. You're going to teach him. You're going to baptize this guy. And he's going to be my chosen instrument. Now, when he first has that conversation with Ananias, you know what Ananias does? Ananias goes, uh, you know who he is. <laughs> and then God goes, no, Ananias, I don't, I don't know who the guy is. Of course I know who he is. I'm God. And he said, he is my chosen instrument. Now go, I'm telling you, he is my chosen instrument. He's going to do good in the world. He's going to be my tool for good in the world. Guys, if you go, yeah, Mackie, you don't know my past. Well, I'm pretty sure ain't nobody in here got the past of Paul. Anybody in here been hunting Christians lately? Sniping them? No, I don't think so. And so if God goes, I can use that dude, the one that's killing all my people. Yeah, I can use him. In fact, I want him. And I want to extend mercy to him. If he can extend it to Paul, he can extend it to any of us. And if Paul, by the way, Paul's a pretty influential guy. He wrote most of the New Testament. <laughs> That's something, right? <laughs> what if God wanted to do something great like that in your life? You, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's preacher talk. No, I'm serious. Like, do you know Jesus said something really powerful one time when he was talking to his disciples? He said, you know, if you follow me and the people that follow me later, if they follow me, they're going to do what I've been doing, but they're going to do even greater things than I've been doing. What? Holy moly, man. He did some pretty great stuff. We're supposed to be able to do greater things than that? Yes. Through the power of God's mercy. Um, let's fill in this blank for you guys, for y'all, for uh, Herschel over there has a conniption. If God's mercy is my motivation, God will work in me. If, now this is a bold statement, but I'm just telling you, if God's mercy is your number one motivator, he will work in you. He'll work through you. In 1 Corinthians 15, we hear from Paul again in verse 10. It says, whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out such kindness and grace upon me. Listen, Paul goes, yeah, I got a past. But whatever I am today is for one thing. It's, it's because of his mercy. It's because of his grace. It's because of his kindness. It had nothing to do with me. He says, and it's not without results. For I have worked harder than all the other apostles. Yet actually, I wasn't doing it. But it was God working in me. Man, Paul is not being cocky here. He goes, I worked harder than all the other apostles. And maybe one day they'll get, they'll get mercy, the mercy of God like I get the mercy of God. I can't do anything. I mean, I can't slow down. I can't slow down because these guys are not going that same speed. I worked harder. But Why? He points to the mercy of God. He gives himself zero credit. He goes, it was him working in me. All because I can't help myself. His mercy is too good. Paul was flawed. But do you, I want to make a bold statement again. God has never used an unflawed person. Y'all know that? Except once. Jesus. Everybody else that God used was imperfect. And I mean, like, really imperfect. I want to give you a list. I went down and, and created a list here. Um, there's a video out there, but I, I didn't want to show the video again. I think I showed it maybe last year or something. But um, just listen to this. Abraham. Did he use Abraham? Man, Abraham was old. Some of y'all go, I'm too old, man. I waited too long. Okay, Abraham was... He didn't even get going good until he was like in his 90s, all right? And he didn't even hit the ground running until he was 99, right? That's when God said, hey, man, I know your wife's womb is like dead, <laughs> right? Because she's old too, right? But y'all about to have more kids and y'all know what to do with. You count the stars in the sky, good luck, you know? I think scientists these days say there's something like 60 sextillion. Yeah, go look that up. That's a real thing, okay? It's like... Trillions and trillions and trillions and billions of trillions. and it's, it's crazy. But he goes, you'll have more descendants than there are stars in the sky. So that's Abraham. He's too old right, to be used by God, yet God used him. Um, who else we got here? Jacob. Jacob was a chronic liar. And he ran away from anything that was a challenge. Over and over again. Ran, anything that was hard, I'm out. Leah. 
Leah was unattractive. I mean, she was hit with an ugly stick. How, what can I say? I mean, I didn't, I mean, that's what it's, I didn't make it up. She was hit with an, it was, she just wasn't blessed with beauty. All right. Not external anyway. And God used her. Now you might go, no, that's for them popular girls, man. You know, that's for them girls that dress well and look good and all that. Or that, those guys, you know, no, that's not for me. I got too much acne for anybody to listen to me. I got too much. Man, Leah was hit with the ugly stick. She was used by God. Joseph was abused. Gideon was poor. He was the poorest kid in his entire family. Samson, you know who Samson was? Y'all just let, know he's the guy with long hair that was really strong. Man, you read Samson's story, and it'll make you uncomfortable. This dude was a reckless codependent. That's who he was. A reckless codependent. Horrible dude. And God used him. Rahab was a prostitute, yet she makes the hall of faith. Not the hall of fame, the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And she's commended for her great faith in spite of her prostitution and her sin and her mistakes. Jonah was fearful and reluctant and bucked up against God, went the opposite way. When he told him to go this way, he ran the other way. And God had to send a fish to put him back on course. But he still used him to convert an entire nation and bring them to repentance. Elijah was suicidal. Naomi, uh, who was used by God, was an elderly widow. What can a widow do? Jeremiah had a chronic depression. He cried all the time. He's known as the weeping prophet. David had an affair and then had his mistress's husband killed. You know, out of all of it, I mean, you would think that would disqualify somebody, right? Come on. Out of all the stuff, surely he's disqualified. Nope, that's the dude that's known for, for all time now as the man after God's own heart. He wrote the Psalms that we read all the time and sing songs based on them. That's David. He was used in a powerful way. John the Baptist, dude was weird, right? <laughs> Y'all know anybody weird? I mean, he was very eccentric. That's a better, uh, he's eccentric, right? <laughs> to say the least. And God used him in a powerful way to usher in the Lamb of God coming on the scene. Peter was impulsive. We talked about him a couple of weeks. He's impulsive, stuck his foot in his mouth repeatedly. He had serious anger management problems. Anybody in here struggle with your anger? Guess what? God still wants to use you. He used Peter in a mighty way. Peter chopping people's ears off. Right? Um, Martha. Let's talk about some of the other women. Martha was a worry wart. Anybody in here worry about everything? God goes, yeah, I got some mercy for you too. I got big plans for worry warts. The Samaritan woman had several failed marriages. God used her. In a powerful way. Zacchaeus had been an unethical scam artist. God used him. Thomas had doubts. Timothy was timid. And Moses, David, and Paul were all guilty of murder in their past. And look at what God did with all, all those guys. All those girls. It's amazing. God never used in a powerful way an, a, a perfect person except Jesus. The rest of them, man, I'm talking about flawed that put our flaws, in some cases at least, to shame. So I want to ask you a question. What's your excuse? You busy? <laughs> you busy? Um, you an introvert? What's your excuse? Your past? You're disqualified? You're unqualified? What, what's your excuse? Because God don't like excuses. He goes, look, I don't care about any of that stuff, man. I'll turn an introvert into a preacher. I'll, you know, I'll make a, I'll, I'll make water turn into wine. Not just any water. I'll take the nasty bath water that people are washing themselves in in the basin, and I'll turn that into the good wine. What do you think that 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 miracle is about? It's a, it's called a miraculous sign. All the miracles in John, there's seven of them, and they're called miraculous signs. Why? Because they point to something. Well, that one, what does that point to? Does that point to, well, it's okay to drink wine? Jesus brought the cake to the cake party? That is not what the, that's not the point of that story at all. The point of that story is to go, if he can turn nasty bath water into wine, he might turn my life into something beautiful and useful as well. What's your excuse? Um, anybody got a, a large bill, like money? Anybody got a large bill? Anybody want to volunteer it? Can I, may I have it? You have a hundred? Huh? 
yeah, I don't want, I don't want to know if you need to pay a bill. I need, I need a large piece of money. Okay. <laughs> Anybody have a large piece of money? What you got? What you got, Hirsch? Hundred bucks. Hundred bucks. Thank you, Herschel. Herschel's a brave man. We're about to do a magic trick. I just changed plans. No, <laughs> had something else in mind, but now that there's a hundred, we're going to do a magic trick. Okay. No, um, seriously, um, let me get a volunteer. Who's my volunteer? All right. Uh, all right. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on up. Hurry up. I don't want to show preferential treatment like you always up here, man. But anyway, come on. Nobody's volunteering. All right. Kayla's going to be our uh, Vanna White with the hundred dollar bill. So, all right, here's what we want to do. Raise it up high. Show everybody. It's a real hundred dollar bill. He ain't got counterfeits. That's Herschel, man. You know, Herschel. Who wants the hundred dollar bill on Herschel? Who wants it? You're part of this, so you don't. Okay. All right, now, all right, Kayla, what I want you to do is I want you to um, lay it on the floor, step on it, squish it around a little bit. All right, pick it back up, hold it in there. Who still wants it after her nasty feet touched it? For real? That's pretty. You know where she's been? I mean, okay. I mean, she walked in the bathroom. That's nasty, man. Y'all still want that? All right, let's, let's wrinkle it up. Let's make it into a big ball. Yeah, just, yeah, there you go. Man, all right, hold it up in the air now. Who wants it? What? All right, Kayla, what I need you to do, um, get your best sneeze ready. Sneeze on it. Just, just go. I know it's a fake sneeze, but just at least get some spittle on it. Ready? All right, come on. You can do this. I know. You volunteered. Let's go. Come on. Execute. Just hot shoe. Just on it. Now spit on it. Spit on it. Hutch. Who wants it? Anybody want it? Um, Kayla, I need you to uh, take it. Here, take it. Go take it to the bathroom, and I want you to put it in the toilet. Uh, and if there is a toilet that someone didn't flush, that's the one I want you to put it in. All right, now hold on. And then... I want a show of hands. How many will exit the auditorium or whatever we call this parlor and be willing to go in there and go get the hundred dollar bill? Raise your hand if you still would be willing. Even if there are some floaties? Even if there are some floaties? Okay. Hey, give Kayla a round of applause. And I thank you, Herschel. Um, so, uh, yeah. Why? Why you still want it? Still worth something. What's the point of that? Listen, you guys are that money. I don't care what your past has in it. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what's happened to you. God doesn't either. God, God says, I, it doesn't matter. I will clean you up. You're valuable no matter what. You are way more valuable than a $100 bill. You're everything to me, God would say. Write this down. This is uh, fill in your blanks. Every saint has a past, and every sinner has a future. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, it says, In the past, all of us lived like that, trying to please our sinful selves. We did all the things that our bodies and minds wanted. Like everyone else in the world, we deserve to suffer God's anger just because of the way that we were. But God is rich in mercy, and he loved us very much. We were spiritually dead because of all that we had done against him. But he gave us new life together with Christ. You've been saved by God's grace. Listen, God longs to extend his mercy to you, no matter where you've been or what you've done. And he wants to give you a new life and to use you. He doesn't want you to come to Crossway and attend. He wants you to come to Crossway, hear his word, build relationships with people that have been at it a little longer than you, and learn how to, how to walk with God, and learn what it means to have a relationship with him, and then to give your life to him, and then to be trained and equipped, and then go out and do it for somebody else. That's the plan. If we just come every week and all you do is sit back and go, man, I like that funny illustration. Man, that's a cool sermon. Man, I like the songs. It's, it's a good place to be on Sunday morning. Cool. I mean, I'm glad that that's the case for you. But God wants something much, much bigger. He wants to take you somewhere great. Let me give you the second one. The second secret. 
The first one is let his mercy motivate you. If you do, he's going to use you. Second, relay the truth with authenticity. Relay the truth with authenticity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, Paul says, this is the very next verse, he says, but we have turned away from secret and shameful ways. We don't use trickery, and we don't change the teaching of God. We teach the truth plainly, and this is how we show people who we are. And this is how they can come to know in their hearts what kind of people we are before God. I want you to know something, guys. I want nothing more than to be, I don't want to be that preacher that just, that you guys don't ever interact with or talk to. You know, y'all have been to places like that, right? You try to get in and you try to meet the preacher and, and, you know, he's busy, right? He's a pretty important dude. Got pretty important people to talk to. Man, I ain't important. I feel like I feel like Paul. Hey, hey, that's right. <laughs> hey, y'all weird, man. Anyway, <laughs> no, that's right though. Listen, we're not self-important people. We're just servants of God, man. That have some kind of role that He was gracious enough to let us serve in. We're just His servants. We're not. The, and here's the problem: I met so many preachers, man. They start out at servants, and then they turn into celebrities. It's so sad. They think, they think, man, this church is growing because of me. Get out of here, man. You don't understand how this thing works. And if you're not careful, you take that attitude, God's going to rip that carpet out from under you. We want to teach the truth plainly. We want to be real. We want to share our lives with you guys. We want to share our flaws, our strengths, everything. We just want to be real. We want to be authentic. Here's a definition of authentic that I found online. Um, I would have never said it this way, but I think this is really cool. It's on your notes. Look at this. It says, conforming to to a fact, and therefore, you're worthy of trust, you're worthy of reliance, and you're worthy of belief. This is what we mean by authentic. That we, we need to be authentic in a couple of different ways. The first way... I must be authentic about what God's Word says. Notice what Paul says. He says, I don't change what God's Word says. Listen, there are plenty of things I don't like in the Bible. There are plenty of things. But God goes, hey, take my Word and proclaim it to people. He didn't go, take the parts you like and proclaim that. And he didn't say, hey, if somebody's in the audience that you know doesn't really think the same way, well, then definitely back off of that teaching and don't talk about it. He goes, We just lay it out there, man. It ain't our word. We're just putting it out there, man, because that's what God has sent us to do. We just lay it out there plainly. That's the first way that we be authentic. Don't be fake. Don't be some preacher or some friend of someone that's not willing to say hard things and not willing to point out things that are uncomfortable that God has to say in his word. That's like seeing a kid out in in traffic playing, and you go, yeah, it's not my kid. Yeah, he's about to get hit, but it's not my business. Whatever, man. Go get the kid out of the street. And God goes, man, don't back off from telling my truth. Be authentic. Be real. That's why in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, it's not on your notes, but it is on the screen. It says, watch your life and doctrine closely. He, in other words, he said, watch how you live and watch what you teach. He says, watch them both closely. Because he says, if you persevere in both of them, you will save yourself and you'll save those that listen to you. You know the opposite of that? If I'm a hypocrite, in other words, I live one way and teach another, then I'm not going to be saved, and the people that listen to me are probably going to get led astray as well. It's serious. And you can do the opposite. You can have all the right teachings, but your life don't match, right? You can, do, you, you can be heavy on one side or the other and be damaging. He says, watch those things closely. The second thing that we, the second, or actually second and third way that we need to be authentic is I must be authentic about who I was in my past and who I am right now. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he addresses who he was. He says, yes, I'm the most insignificant of all the apostles. I'm unworthy to even be called an apostle because I hunted down believers and I persecuted God's church. He goes, I am the biggest bum on the planet. 
And another place in Philippians, he would say, I'm the chief of all sinners. There ain't nobody sinned worse than me. That was Paul's opinion of himself. And most of us go, well, at least I don't do what that guy did. Paul's like, no, I am the worst. And when we get to that point, we can, when we can own our past and just openly admit, I was a bum before Jesus. That's when he can use me in a powerful way. That's when my life is going to be an instrument in his hands. The second thing in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, Paul says who he is now. He says, the spirit we receive does not make us slaves again to fear. It makes us children of God. With that spirit, we cry out, Abba, Father. Every week at Crossway, we come together and we share in something we call the Lord's Supper. Some call it communion or the Eucharist. This is such an amazing thing when you think about it, that Jesus instituted this so many years ago, but he wanted us to participate in it. It's actually what I think is one of the miracles of mercy, that we get to come and get invited to the table of God. You know, if you got invited to the table at the White House, like you were one of the ten that got invited to the White House, you'd be like, whoa, man, this is, this, what do I wear? You know, you've been invited not to the White House, you've been invited to God's house. You've been invited to the table of God, to dine, to commune. What a privilege. What a special, special time. It's not just a little piece of cracker. It's not just a little cup of juice. We are participating in something very spiritually significant. And what I want you, I want you to make this connection this morning based on the passage we just read that we don't want to be slaves of fear anymore. We want to be children of God. Who gets invited to God's table? His children. Actually, everyone's invited. But the ones who actually get to the table and actually participate in a communion where you and God are united and on the same page, that's his children. And what comes with that, man, knowing that the Father has a place at the table for you? I ain't got to be a slave to fear anymore. He's on my side. I'm going to dinner with God. <laughs> I'm going to supper with God. Y'all can't tell me nothing. <laughs> I'm going to supper with God. He has a place for me. I don't have to be a slave to fear. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. It's an honor to come to your table and to, communion, to commune with you as your child. You've called me your child, Father, because back in 1998, I surrendered my life to King Jesus, and I've been doing it his way as the best I know how um, since then. And God, I'm not perfect. You know that. But you meet, with, you meet me with mercy every time that I fail. And you always have a place for me at your table. So as we come to this table and we take this little piece of bread and that represents your son's body and we take this little cup of juice that represents his blood that was shed on the, the cross for us, I pray, God, we can think about where our worth really comes from. It comes from your willingness to sacrifice your only son, Jesus, for our sake. God, I pray that we can be motivated by your mercy. I pray that we can be willing to relay the truth with authenticity and that we can understand that that means I'm open about my past and I'm open about who I am now. God, thank you for taking my past and forgiving it, helping me move on from it and helping me have a new identity to be called your child. God, for those that are your children here this morning, I pray they can have a special time as they take communion. For those that are guests with us, I pray they not feel uh, the need to do this, but if they want to, then Father, I pray they'll feel comfortable to do that and that this would just be a special time, all of us together. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. I'm no longer Mother's wound, you 
you have chosen me, Father has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your love flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. I am surrounded. By the arms of the Father, I am surrounded by songs of deliverance. We've been liberated from the bondage. Let us sing our freedom. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My dreams were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. secret to God using you that we learn from the life of Paul is to renew my mind continually. And maybe after you write continually, you circle that word. Renew my mind continually. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the very next verse in verse 4 says, the God who rules this world. Wait a minute. I thought there was only one God. No, this is lowercase God. The God who rules this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. They cannot see the light, which is the good news about our glorious Christ, who shows what God is like. It says they're blinded. They can't see it. Somebody in this world, the God of this world, Paul calls him. And we understand this to be Satan, the devil. It's surely talking about the one who comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He's blinded the minds. Here's what I want you to take from this. Paul's saying, if you want the secret, you need to understand where the battlefield is. The battlefield is in your mind. That's where the battleground is. That's why Jesus and John the Baptist and so many of the preachers of the New Testament, when they come and they go, the kingdom of heaven is near, you know what they accompany that with? They say, repent. It's the Greek word metanoia, and it literally means to change your mind. Because the battlefield is our minds. Let's look at... Um, how about we get on the right page? That would be good, wouldn't it? 
Some of you guys have a hard time hearing God and, and getting your mind to change because you're listening to the wrong things. You're bombarding your mind with the wrong things. Listen, let me, let me ask some really hard questions. Y'all ready? Put your seatbelt on. Everybody, everybody put the seatbelt on. Okay, y'all ready? All right, good. You got it over the shoulder. That's good. You're going to need it. So you ever wonder why you have such a negative attitude toward those that disagree with you when you watch endless hours of CNN or Fox News or listen to endless hours of political talk radio? I don't know if that hits anybody. If it does, if the shoe fits, put it on. If it doesn't, let's move on. See if we can put, find another shoe for you to put on. Ever wonder why your husband isn't enough? When you watch endless hours of fantasy and fairy tale love stories? Ever wonder why your wife isn't enough when you spend countless hours looking at pornography? Ever wonder why you can never shake that sin that you constantly, when you constantly surround yourself by others that participate in that same sin just as much, if not more, than you do? Ever wonder why you struggle paying attention when someone's talking about the Bible? When you spend countless hours on your phone, television, computer with nonstop, rapid stimulation of all your senses. And then somebody can't tickle all your senses or flash to a next commercial quick enough. And so you've lost attention. Do you understand, guys, that every generation over the last few decades has drastically gone down in their attention spans? It's been proven. Drastically. You ever wonder why so many people bore you? Maybe it's time to take a little ownership. Watch this video. This is powerful to me. Did you know the average person spends four years of his life looking down at a cell phone? Kind of ironic game. How these touch screens can make us lose touch. But it's no wonder in a world filled with iMacs, iPads, and iPhones, so many eyes, so many selfies, not enough us as we see. Technology has made us more selfish and separate than ever. Because while it claims to connect us, connection has gotten no better. And let me express first, Mr. Zuckerberg, not to be rude, but you should reclassify Facebook to what it is, an anti-social network. Because while we may have big friend lists, so many of us are friendless all alone. Because friendships are more broken than the screens on our very phones. We sit at home on our computers measuring self-worth by numbers of followers and likes. Ignoring those who actually love us, it seems we'd rather write an angry post and talk to someone who might actually hug us at our bucket. You tell me, because I asked a friend the other day, let's meet up face to face. And said, all right, what time do you want us to Skype? I responded with OMG as I rested in a bunch of SMHs and realized, what about me? Do I not have the patience to have a conversation without abbreviation? This is the generation of media overstimulation. Chats have been reduced to snaps. The news is 140 characters. Videos are six seconds at high speed. And you wonder why ADD is on the rise faster than 4G LTE. But Get a load of this. Studies show the attention span of the average adult today is one second lower than that of a goldfish. So if you're one of the few people on a quad cannibals that have yet to click off or close this video, congratulations. Let me finish by saying you do have a choice. Yes. But this one, my friends, we cannot autocorrect. We must do it ourselves. Take control or be controlled. Make a decision. Me. The longer do I want to spoil a precious moment by recording it with a phone, I'm just going to keep them. I don't want to take a picture of all my meals anymore, I'm just going to eat them. I don't want the new app, the new software, or the new update. And if I want to post an old photo, who says I have to wait until Thursday? I'm so tired of performing in the pageantry of vanity, and conforming to this accepted form of digital insanity. Call me crazy, but... I imagine a world where we smile when we have low batteries. Because that'll mean we'll be one bar closer to humanity.
I don't know about y'all. That's pretty powerful. That dude's talented and uh, speaking some wisdom. You can't autocorrect humanity, though, right? You can't autocorrect. In Romans chapter 12, he tells us how do we correct it. I told you the battlefield's the mind. Listen to this. Paul says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It is not as easy as the men in black de-neuralizer, is it? Y'all know what I'm talking about? We got a picture here. Uh, Yeah. If only it were that easy, that we could be zapped and think different and think like Jesus. But it takes intentionality. It takes me deciding that I'm going to control what goes in my mind. Garbage in, garbage out. That's no, nothing new. But we got we to gotta decide, guys, that we're going to stop filling our minds with crap. We're going to start filling it with something good that leads us to God and leads us to relationship with people. Number four, the secret. Remember that it's not about me. It's not about me. Y'all say that with me. It's not about me. No, some of y'all really need to say it. It's not about me. Listen. We got an awful lot of opinions, right? Awful lot of ideas. People think they've got the best way. People think they've got the corner on the right thing. Guys, it is not about us. It's about God. It's about his mission. It's not about us. I want to um, look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, the very next verse. It says, we're like clay jars. That's all we are. In which this treasure that we have is stored. The real power comes from God and not from us. So God pictures us as clay pots. Look at this clay pot. And the beauty of this clay pot is there's something really cool inside, right? You want to know what's in there, right? Yeah. The only reason you know anything's in there, though, you know what? It's because we're clay and we're broken and we're shattered and we've made mistakes and we've got a past. And it's through those cracks when we get put back together that God shines and goes, I did that. I put this thing together. See that thing in here? That's what you really want to know about. We're just clay pots, just broken, shattered. We're all a bunch of crack pots, in other words, right? God is really good. Number five, here's another secret for you. Recycle my pain and help others. Recycle my pain and help others. In 2 Corinthians 4, the next couple of verses in 8 and 9, Paul says, we often suffer, but we're never crushed. Even when we don't know what to do, we never give up. In times of trouble, God is with us. And when we are knocked down, we get up again. He says, listen, I know what pain is. And I know you know what pain is. Some people in here have been hurting. Some of y'all have been going through some stuff. Paul knows all about pain. And he goes, don't let the pain be wasted. God can use your pain in a really powerful way, in a really profound way. In uh, 2 Corinthians 4.15, listen to what Paul says. He says, these sufferings of ours, he's talking about him and some of the other apostles that have been persecuted for what they're doing and teaching. I mean, Paul went through it. He, I think it's five times that he was lashed 39, 39 times, like 40 lashes minus one. He endured that, I think it's five times. We can look that up. He was beat with rods, I think, three times. He was shipwrecked a bunch of times. He was treated horribly by his own people, the Jews. He was treated horribly by the Gentiles. There were all kinds of things that people did to Paul. And he says, these sufferings are for your benefit. And the more of you who are one to Christ, the more there are to thank him for his great kindness. And the more the Lord is glorified. Paul says, I'm not going to hide my weakness. I'm not going to pretend it's not there. He even even doesn't say, I'm going to own my weakness. He goes, I'm going to glory in my weakness. I'm going to advertise my weakness so somebody else who has it is going to benefit. If I've been through it, somebody else is going to go through it, and I can show them how to come out on the other end. Don't waste pain. Find ways to glory in it and let God use it. This is a secret 
Take your pain, let God get you through it with the help of others, and then you get up and you find somebody else and you help them through it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, he says, All praises belong to God the Father our, and our Lord Jesus Christ, for He is the Father of tender mercy and the God of endless comfort. He always comes alongside us to comfort us in our suffering so that, circle, so that, so that we can come alongside those who are in painful trial and we can bring them the same comfort that God poured out on us. And the final secret, you want to be used by God? We need to remain focused on eternity, and that is in contrast to the non-eternal. You know the difference between eternal things and non-eternal things? Well, at least one of the differences is that you can't see some of the eternal things. And the non-eternal things that we get so wrapped up with, they're right in our face every day. Going, I'm important. I should be focused on. I'm all that matters. You want God to use you, you learn to see the unseen. And you learn to stop focusing on the, uh, on the seen things, the temporary things. None of us. Huh, well, let me read this passage. This is a funny passage to me. In 2 Corinthians 4, the next couple of verses, 16 and 17, it says, We never give up our bodies. Listen to this. And say amen when you can. Our bodies are gradually dying. <laughs> amen. I know. It's a terrible thing. My knees hurt, bro. My back. Anyway. But we ourselves are being made stronger each day. He ain't talking about your body. He's talking about your soul. And then he says these little troubles that we tend not to call that. Oh, the sky is falling, man. This is a big problem. Paul goes, it's just a little trouble. He says, are getting us ready for an eternal glory. That will make all of our troubles seem like nothing. You want to know how good heaven is? Y'all want to know what happens? So this is how good heaven is. You think about the worst day anybody on this earth has ever had or could ever have. Multiply it by 20. And, and I'm talking about the worst. And heaven is so good. That it says it will be like that huge, horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. Will be like nothing. That's how good heaven is. So why focus on here and now and not cast our eyes to the place that we're all hopefully headed? Um, and that's why in 2 Corinthians 4 18, it's uh, really our last verse of that section of scripture. It says, So we don't look at what we see, what we can see right now, the troubles all around us. That's not what you look at. Don't look at that. Don't focus on that. He says, But we look forward to the joys in heaven, which we have not yet seen. The troubles will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. The key to remaining focused, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say this, and I sound like a broken record, and that's okay, because it's a record y'all all need to play, okay? The key to remaining focused, fill in the blank, your small group. Some of y'all chuckle. <laughs> I don't know how you do it without a small group. I've been in churches that made small groups optional. It didn't work as much as I wanted it to. I like options. It don't work. In Hebrews chapter 10, we're warned about it. In verse 25, this is not the time to pull away. Some of y'all need to hear that. Y'all hear God talking to you? This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together, as some have formed the habit of doing. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that day dawning. Do y'all understand I literally wake up and I thank God for his mercy every morning. But I also wonder that morning, is this the day that Jesus is coming back? I can't wait to see what it looks like for, a cloud, for the clouds to be rolled up like scrolls. I can't wait. I see things in the sky sometimes. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Okay, okay that's, not, that's an airplane or something. You know? <laughs> I'm like, is that the sun? No, it's not okay. I'm serious. But do you guys? Or do you go, I, yeah, he's coming at some point. It's probably a long time from now. I'll probably die before he comes. Man, I just don't, I don't 
I don't live like that. I live with my eyes on heaven. I can't wait. I, I want it. And I think to the degree that you can keep your eyes that way, he's going to use you more. But take some discipline. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12, it says a person standing alone, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. At Crossway, we are a small group church. We are not a church that has small groups. We are a church that depends on them. We can't function without them. And we will not accept anybody as a member without them. You, you can't do it because we have to. We have to care about each other. We have to look after each other. I need you to keep me accountable, and you need me to keep you accountable. None of us are immune to Satan's schemes and to being blinded to the good things that God has for us. We need each other to keep those blinders minimized. Finally, in Matthew 18, verse 20, hear Jesus' words. He says, when two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. Now, I understand the context of this passage. It's in the context of disciplining somebody, actually. Somebody that wouldn't listen. You know, somebody did a sin. A brother went to them. They wouldn't listen. So they got a couple other brothers to go. They still wouldn't listen. Then they took it to the whole church and said, hey, listen, guys, we've tried. Why don't y'all all go make an effort? Go get with that brother and try to convince him yourselves. And that's what happened. But then Jesus goes, you know, if, if that doesn't work, you got to separate. And that's Jesus saying that. That's like his methodology. That's what he says we need to do. And we need to love people enough to, to have that hard, tough love sometimes in hopes that they will ultimately come back. If that's in the context, and at the very end he goes, and where two or you, two or more of you agree, come together and agree, I back it. I'm there. But there's a larger principle at play. When we're together in his name, living for him together in community, he shows up. And I want to leave you with um, three principles, or three questions, rather. Three questions, and we're done. Do you want your life to be used by God? You answer that. God wants to use you. That ain't, that ain't the question. The question is, do you want to be used by God? Or do you just want to float through life and let life just be about you? You'll eventually get frustrated. You'll eventually get bored. You'll eventually start filling your life with other things that's just going to hurt you. So you need to answer the question, do I want my life to be used by God? Secondly, what has been holding you back? It could be any number of things. What has been your excuse? What is presently your excuse? And then finally, are you ready to experience the miracle of mercy? We do miracle of mercy in our small groups. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're an adult, then we do our small group uh, miracle of mercy. We watch a video about the miracle of mercy. Uh, you don't listen to me preach. Okay, and then we just have a short discussion. And then uh, we do that on Mondays at 630. You're invited. Everybody's invited. Uh, 501 Spider Monkey Court. That's my address. Write it down. Show up Monday. All right. Uh, when's the campus do it? Sundays at 6.30. So today at 6.30. If you want to join the college group, uh, they're not as cool as the adults, but it's okay. You know, no, I'm kidding. They're, they're kind of cooler than us in, some, in a lot of ways. So make sure you go and attend. Um, teens, when are y'all doing that? Sundays and Wednesdays. So if you're interested, raise your hand, Dimitri. That's our youth minister. If you're interested in attending, he's going to let you know this week when, when that's going to happen and where you need to be. And I encourage everybody, whether you're a teen, uh, you're an adult, you're in the, in the college ministry, go to one of these small groups and let the miracle of mercy do something in your life. Uh, in your bulletin, there's a communication card. Take that out, members and guests alike. I would like you to fill that out now as we sing a song. Take the opportunity to fill that out. Let us know how we can serve you. Let us know how we can help you. Um, for our members, we ask that you uh, drop not only that communication card in one of the baskets around the room, but we also ask that you put in your collection, your um, contribution to keep the ministry alive and active. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Uh, it's, it's a lot we covered, and, uh, but I'm, I'm grateful for your word, and I pray, God, that it sinks deep into our hearts and minds, and it, it provokes us to change. God, I pray that you've spoken specifically to people this morning, that your spirit has been in operation. I know it has. So, God, I pray that anything that I said that was off kilter, or just, just let my words fall off and, and let your words sink deep in 
and just change us, God, from the inside out. Help us to embrace your mercy and help us to be used by you, Father, moving forward. In Jesus' name.